Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to today's book discussion on rebalancing Asia, the Belt and Road Initiative and Indo-Pacific Strategy, which is published by Springer, Singapore. This book is jointly edited by Dr. Deepak Prakash Bhatt and me, where we have 18 chapters from 25 scholars from 15 countries. From Asia, we have contributors from Nepal, India, Iran, Taiwan, China, Bangladesh, Thailand, Japan, and Sri Lanka. From Europe, we have Italy, France, Germany, and France, uh, and uh, Greece. And we also have scholars from Australia and the United States of America. Uh, we conceived the idea of bringing this book in July 2019 at a coffee shop in Kashmiru with Dr. Bhatt. We believe at the time that there will be intense competition leading to rivalry in days to come between the US and China. Some of the scholars at the time disagreed with, disagreed with us. However, at present, it is more visible as we have predicted. Uh, in fact, there were debates. Uh, in fact, there are debates about the arrival of new Cold War uh, at the moment. Uh, we're also organizing a discussion on 23rd February where we are looking at the new Cold War, whether it's myth or reality. The book was supposed to be published in July 2020, but we were hit by pandemic. We also got occupied in building our own think tank, Nice Nepal, and the process uh, got delayed by a year. However, we got the book published last year in September. So far, as per the Springer's website, uh, we have more than 2,400 downloads of the book, and probably a huge, huge number of copies are sold out. The South Asian edition of this book is yet to be released, and we believe that it will have huge number of downloads or purchases once it arrives in Asia. The book is essential for everyone who are interested in geopolitics, China's foreign policy, or the Indo-Pacific strategy. Our aim was to initiate an academic debate on these emerging issues, which we have succeeded through this book. We at NICE Nepal would be glad to engage in this kind of research and discussions, which can help us understand the emerging global challenges that are going to witness in days to come and impact uh, the region. Today's discussion is divided into two uh, parts. Where in first, we have some renowned scholars from Japan, India, China, and the US, where they will highlight how the US and China are going to compete in Asia for their influence. While in the second part, we'll have editors and a few of the contributors will share their perspectives. The program is streaming live on Facebook as well. Please do share the link on your social media. Let me start uh, with uh, the first speaker. At first, we have Professor Dr. Taniguchi Tomohiko. Dr. Taniguchi Tomohiko is a professor at Kyo University, Graduate School of System Design and Management, reading international politi political economy and Japanese economy, Japanese diplomacy. He was a special advisor to Prime Minister Shinzo Abe. Between February 2013 and March 2014, he was counselor at Prime Minister's office. After spending 20 years with Nikkei Business, he joined the Ministry of Foreign Affairs as Deputy Press Secretary and Deputy Director General for Public Diplomacy. In 1999, the Foreign Press Association in London elected him president, the first from the East of Suez. During his journalistic career, he has spent sabbatical in, at Woodrow Wilson School, Princeton University, as a Fulbright Visiting Fellow at the Shanghai Institute of International Studies and at the Brookings Institution as a paid Synapse Fellow. He also served as the executive advisor to the chairman of Central Japan Railway Company, Kasai Yoshiyuki, while holding visiting professorship at Kyo SDM and Meiji University School of Global Development Japanese Studies. He has authored and co-authored more than 10 books on international affairs. Professor, you have around 15 minutes, over to you. Thank you, thank you very much, Dr. Jaiswal. Let me begin by congratulating uh, on the publication of the fascinating book co-edited by uh, two doctors, uh, Pramod Jaiswal, uh, Deepak uh, Prakash Bhatt. I believe this book is going to be used widely by uh, professors and teachers and instructors, not only in the region, but across the world because it is so much timely and it's uh, got a good assortment of um, uh, scholars and uh, professors looking at the region. 
Now, uh, using my time, let me just give you three points uh, for you to chew on as a food for thought. The first point of mine is the competition between the concepts of BRI and Indo-Pacific is about a regime competition, one between democracy and autocratic dictatorship. That's my first point. The second point of mine is that the competition is about two geographic concepts, one that is overland and the other that is overseas. The former is about landscape, the latter seascape. That's my second point. The third and final point of mine is, it is about how one views the world. The BRI is about a hierarchical system. The Indo-Pacific concept are horizontal. The former is a modern day second coming of suzerain tributary system, China centric. The latter peer to peer partnerships. Let me just elaborate a little bit more on each one of these three points. First, a regime competition. On this point, one must take note that democracy remains unknown to the people in China, let alone Mr. Xi and his party comrades. For there has been no point in time when they exercise anything akin to representative democracy, which values people's right to criticize their leaders. There must be absolutely no crime punishable when one exercises one's innate right for freedom. Democracy may be a curious animal because for it to grow and mature, it takes not a generation, but generations, plural. And yet, however lousy, messy, and slow moving, democracy is the regime that wins people's hearts because it works bottom up, not top down. Here in my country, of Japan, people of the country are the ones that have been there, done that in their history. As a result, there is the brand of theirs is the brand of democracy, hard won, and that there is no doubt whatsoever hovered by the people as to the ultimate value of democracy. Also, only by hoisting the banner of democracy, just as Japan has done more so of late, one can expect to have more friends and partners. China, on the other hand, has very few friends that value could bind. They only have stakeholders. Second, it is about two geographic concepts, overland, overseas, landscape, seascape. China claims that it is both a land power and a sea power. The claim admittedly is more about their aspirations rather than about a factual depiction. True. Beijing is busy building presence in the Indian Ocean region, culminating, ironically, only in bringing Australia and India ever closer to Japan and the United States. Hence, Quad, two of the biggest sea powers. 
over land. China has neighbors that are much smaller, much weaker than China. Such countries as officials in Beijing often look down upon. Overseas, on the other hand, Japan benefits from a coalition of democratic peers, allies, and partners. The concept of the free and open Indo-Pacific has thus come to take shape. Third, it is about how one views the world. The BRI is about a hierarchical system, the Indo-Pacific concept, a horizontal. The former is a modern day second coming of suzerain tributary system. The latter, peer-to-peer -peer partnerships. On this point, as my final remark, let me just um, uh, tell you a little bit of the genesis of the concept Indo-Pacific. We must begin by recollecting how the world looked like in the early 1980s. Uh, it, it should go without saying that China was as poor as North Korea is today. And Southeast Asian countries have yet to take off. However, the Japanese foreign direct investment uh, triggered by the appreciated value of Japanese yen started to pour into corner to corner in the South, Southeast Asian region. Malaysia gradually would uh, emerge as a hub of automotive production. Indonesia followed, let alone Singapore, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and South Korea, four of the early tigers. At that time, Australian Prime Minister, Japanese Prime Minister got together and pushed forward a brand new geographic concept of Asia Pacific. And that was the background of the creation of another regional institution of APEC, Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation. Pundits and opinion formers across the region and beyond all talked about the emergence of the Asia Pacific region. Neglected therein was obviously South Asia, especially China, India. And then came 2000s in response to China's rather China-centric multilateral democracy, um, diplomacy, sorry about that, uh, that uh, brought in the entire ASEAN uh, countries to its free trade regime. Uh, remember that uh, it was when China was acceded into WTO and China hosted its first multilateral gathering of APEC meetings in 2001 in Shanghai. Created around, that, created around that time was something called EAS, East Asia Summit. Singapore, Japan worked hard together to bring in India and Australia, New Zealand. Thus created was ASEAN plus China, South Korea, Japan, India, Australia, New Zealand. By the way, RCEP is the flip side of the same coin of EAS. And then gradually recognition took root that India was getting out of its um, mold of um, autar autarky and non-alignment sentiment. And then uh, 
it was assured that in the 21st century, India would become larger, richer, even than China in the long run. And that in the Indian Ocean, uh, the Indian Ocean region would become rather like an industrial corridor, corridor that would bind the Eastern shore of African continent, South Asian nations and beyond the uh, East Asian nations uh, too. Around that time, uh, Shinzo Abe, when he was prime minister between 2006 and seven, went to India and then prime minister of India, Mamohan Sin, invited him to make an address to the joint house of Indian parliament, which Shinzo Abe duly accepted and did in summer 2007. The title of that speech was elaborately chosen, Confluence of the Two Seas. In that speech, Shinzo Abe spoke extensively about how two seas, quote unquote, the Indian Ocean and the Pacific should merge and how two democracies, the biggest democracy in the world, India, and the long-standing democracy in Asia, Japan, should work together. That this was the genesis of the concept of Indo-Pacific has been widely recognized by both Trump and Biden administrations in the US, by three prime ministers uh, uh, successively in Australia, and by the UK and so on and so forth. So that was the genesis. And at the bottom of this notion is the expectation that going forward, well into the middle of this century, the roles to be played by South Asian nations, particularly India, would gain even more importance. Well, I should stop here. I have told you of three observations that I have gathered while reading the book. And I do hope that what's been said by me is going to be food for thought for further discussions uh, in the remainder of this great conference. With thanks to the organizer, I should stop here. Uh, thank you, Professor Dr. Taniguchi Tomohiko for your remarks. May I now invite Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, a VSM and Bar VSM retired. Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan is Director General of the National Maritime Foundation, New Delhi. He has been the principal evaluator of the Navy's battle tactics and the head of Naval Training Team at the Defense Services Staff College and the principal director of Naval Operations. As a flag officer, he was the Navy's first assistant chief of the Naval Staff, Foreign Cooperation and Intelligence. As a vice admiral, he has been chief of staff of the Western Naval Command and he has been command commanded three times by the President of India for sustained distinguished service. Apart from being on a visiting faculty of the higher command establishment of all three of India's defense services, also as tri services established such as the College of Defense Management, Hyderabad and National Defense College, New Delhi. He has also been advising the government through his uh, interaction with the integrated headquarters of the Ministry of Defense, Navy and Ministry of External Affairs and the National Security Council Secretariat and the Joint Intelligence Committee. He is, in addition, a prolific writer with over 85 published professional articles and papers and a respected advisor and fellow of several international reputed think tanks, including Asanta Espen Center, the Forum for Strategic and Security Studies, and the Center for Advanced Study, Strategy and Security Studies. Admiral Chauhan, over to you, sir, and you also have 15 minutes. Thank you very much. First of all, let me <clears throat> compliment uh, uh, both of you uh, for the wonderful book. And I, I entirely echo uh, the, the comments made by uh, 
Professor Taniguchi. Uh, Taniguchi-san has already said quite clearly that this book is going to be a seminal one and it will serve as a reference point and a takeoff point for many discussions over many years. So my, uh, my heartiest congratulations and also my thanks to you to, um, for giving me the opportunity to say one or two uh, words and express some thoughts of my own. Uh, I intend to follow uh, the example, but expand it a little uh, of Taniguchi-san's uh, own approach, which is to tell you something in five, uh, along five, um, shall we say, bulleted points. The first of these is in examining the um, differences between the US and the Chinese approach to the uh, connectivity or the mega connectivity endeavors of both these countries that are arguably leading to a certain amount of competition and definitely have the potential to convert that competition into confrontation and hopefully not into conflict, but the potential cannot be ignored. So the first of these is the approach uh, he Taniguchi-san has already indicated one measure of that approach, and I don't have much of a quarrel with it, but I do want to make some uh, departure and uh, perhaps amplify one aspect. You know, that is the first difference is the manner in which they approach the approach of um, the two powers. And in I would hasten to add uh, the approach of Japan and India and Australia, and of course the United States versus the BRI is firstly this. Number one, the BRI is a mega connectivity project. It is not the only mega connectivity project in play within the geography of the, of the Indo-Pacific. There are several others ranging from uh, the Asia-Africa growth corridor, whether this is to be done jointly, or it is to be done singly is, is not material. The fact that Africa will play a great role uh, is crucial and therefore the first element is uh, that in some cases, the geographies of the two constructs vary, not only between seascape and landscape, but also between the geographical limits. And in my discussion, I would like very much to uh, include not only South Asia, uh, but also West Asia and uh, East Africa. That's my that's my frame of reference. So my first point is that there is a difference between money and currency. And the BRI is predicated upon money. Money is one form of currency. So when people say that, you know, in the second forum of the BRI, uh, all the na nation states of Africa trotted up and uh, queued up in line for the to Beijing, uh, there is nothing remarkable about that. What is remarkable is that when India hosts uh, a summit of African leaders, 52 African leaders do show up. So why did they come? If money was to be everything, then why did this actually happen? Intuitively, therefore, there is some variation between approaches that are predicated upon money and approaches that are predicated upon currency, where currency is shared by the peoples of that particular target grouping of, of countries. So when the BRI is compared to, uh, say, a democratic process of engagement or connectivity, one thing that stands out is that the BRI is a bit like a, a, a model that is based on, I would say, a shopping mall. You go to a supermarket and you pick up a bag of flour. You don't particularly care what happened to the flour. You don't care what happened to the shelf. What you care about is what happened to your larder and what is happening to your kitchen. And that is the Chinese BRI approach, I'm afraid. So one day Tanzanians wake up and find that all the fishermen are Chinese or all the vegetable vendors are Chinese and even the low end jobs have disappeared. Now this cannot happen for long without pushback. It is uh, therefore a good thing for all concerned, all the people who are engaged in um, connectivity projects to bear in mind that connectivity must not benefit solely the the initiator of that connectivity must, but must benefit all the people. Uh, Taniguchi-san uh, explained this uh, rather well in, in, in outlining the differences between horizontal and uh, hierarchical approaches, as well as between autocratic and uh, democratic approaches. So this is not a political issue, uh, not a political statement that I want to make, but really uh, a, a, a geopolitical one, which is predicated upon um, the geoeconomic approach 
So in one case, we have uh, a top-down uh, approach to the BRI of the BRI where the proceeds are directly meant to benefit solely China. And in the other case, I think that there is a much more regionally sensitive approach in which the prosperity of the nations who are being connected uh, is also given primacy. My second point is this business of the rules-based order, which is a, a prerequisite to any kind of commercial or economic or people-to-people -people or technological or any other facet of connectivity. You cannot have connectivity uh, if there's going to be non-predictability of behavior and that behavior is going to be unpredictable to a point where it might lead to disruption of normal intercourse between nation states. Here, I think once again that the differences are stark and the American uh, Quad uh, based or the India led IPOI is perhaps a much more, uh, much more promising uh, approach to connectivity. So the Indo-Pacific Oceans Initiative identifies major aspects and then predicates itself upon inclusivity. It asks everybody to take part in these really important facets. So the Prime Minister uh, of India uh, has made two fundamental, crucial statements, which are shared, I think, by all the members of the Quad and largely I don't wish to limit myself to the Quad because they are shared across the region and the region is the Indo-Pacific. The first of these is India's uh, statement of policy of Sagar, which states quite unequivocally that what we seek is security and growth for all in the region, not for some one person. A rules-based order that supports this, that is uh, respectful of other nations, their sovereignty, their rights, is one that is likely to be more attractive uh, to the people. And here, I think that the BRI has some significant foundational structural flaws which, it, which China needs to address if it is going to end up in serious competition. So a rules-based order where the rules are not based in one or another capital, but have been consensually arrived at through a process of debate, discussion, marked by committee, by which I mean mutual respect between nations. My third point is that no nation should give itself some time frame and say that I'm going to be the number one power by so-and-so year, particularly not a nation that gives great, as, that lays great store by the concept of face. No Westphalian state, sir, has actually emerged as the global hegemon without first being or simultaneously being a maritime hegemon. Now for the BRI to propel China to this position, which is their dream, uh, requires that China be able to muster sufficient maritime power, which is an offtake of what uh, Tanuguchi San said about uh, seascapes, to the combined maritime powers of Japan, of the United States, of Australia, of India, of Vietnam, of perhaps other nation states that need not currently be uh, specifically identified or named. So this business of how to approach maritime power without it becoming corrosive or singly concentrated upon an original point uh, is something that I think the BRI would do well. If it wishes to be a serious comp competitor to the remainder of the countries here, should bear in mind. However, my fourth point is, I think, seminal, and that is it is not necessary, nor is it intended by us to compete with the BRI. No nation is interested in ending up in having to choose between two competing powers. What we must be able to do is offer you will never go offer alternatives. You will never go to a shop which only sells one shirt and either you buy that shirt or you go shirtless. You will always be, it will always be your preference to go to a shop that has many shirts and leaves it to you and your wisdom to decide whether you want this one or the other or you want a third. Therefore, the provision of alternatives 
is really quite important in determining the manner in which this particular BRI connectivity or any other form of connectivity will in fact uh, pan out. And my last point uh, is once again to emphasize that when we talk about a US-China competition building up, I think that we are being unduly restrictive in our, in our thinking. First of all, neither the US, United States nor the, uh, nor the People's Republic of China are the arbiters of anybody's fate other than their own, perhaps. And therefore, it smacks of great hubris for us to be able to say if we were Chinese that we are in competition with that other country or for that country, the United States, to say that they are in competition because that reduces everybody else to ciphers. And that is certainly a poor strategy, whether it emanates from Washington or it emanates from Beijing in both cases. Consequently, it is important to recognize there is intrinsic pride, intrinsic worth, intrinsic uh, committee that must be respected for the region and the peoples of the states of that region. Of that region. It is not, it is not either a good idea nor likely to be a successful one to reduce this to some childish binary between two given powers. It would be a fundamental mistake. I'm sure that your book addresses this and much more, and I'm certainly not in the, uh, I certainly don't have the uh, credentials to be able to, um, to compete with the, uh, with the intellectual delight that your book offers, so I will stop here. And, uh, uh, and, and look forward to any views or any uh, debate that might follow. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, for your remarks. May I now invite Professor Dr. Chang Jiadong. Professor Chang Jiadong is the Director of Center for South Asian Studies at Furan University, Shanghai. From August 1999 to July 2001, he studied at the Center for International Relations uh, Studies in one university and got a master's degree in international relations. He received a PhD from the School of International Relations and Public Affairs, Fudan University, China. In 2005, Professor Chang joined the Center for American Studies at Fudan University, working on terrorism affairs, anti-terrorism, and American anti-terrorism policy. His research interests include anti-proliferation and anti-terrorism in general, the policies of the US and China on, the, on these issues in particular, and China's cooperation on international security. He has, he has several publications on his research areas and has received several awards for this research. Uh, Professor Chang Jiadong, over to you, sir. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pramod. Firstly, I want to uh, congratulate uh, you and your uh, people and your, your, your colleague uh, for this book's uh, publication. And uh, it's very rare. I read it. I think uh, uh, this book is uh, comprehensive and a lot of papers. Uh, in, in such for and uh, give me lots of uh, uh, very deep uh, imaging for me for myself. Uh, I have 40 minutes. I just have several uh, points uh, actually uh, for this book's topic. Uh, the first thing I want to make a comparison uh, between uh, BRI and the IPS Indo-Pacific uh, strategy. Uh, I found uh, several uh, differences. The first difference, you know, BRI, so I means initiative, it's not a strategy, it's also uh, not a policy. BRI's core is a cooperation in lots of issues, specifically in infrastructure uh, construction uh, issues. BRI's goal is to promote economic and trade cooperation and uh, to realize uh, common development uh, uh, of relevant countries uh, between China and other countries. So uh, in fact, BRI has, uh, do not have any specific uh, objectives, nor any specific uh, goals and uh, time, frame, time frame, only some uh, implementation guidelines or, or principles, uh, even directions, and uh, not any specific approach very interesting. But uh, the IPS, uh, Indo Pacific Strategy, is a strategy. The S is a strategy. A strategy means it must focus on military issue, political uh, issue, and it must to achieve some specific 
security or military uh, goals uh, by relevant countries. Uh, so it's very different, the first difference. The second uh, difference is the BRI is an open initiative and the IPS is exclusive. It means IPS just want some people invited, not every country can choose. BRI, no borders, no specific scope, and all countries and regions where uh, can, can join. And uh, for example, China even invites India to participate, but India uh, denied. But IPS is different. IPS has specific boundaries and scope, and they are selective and exclusive. Uh, even uh, some countries, including the US and India, uh, try to expand IPS, but uh, it, it still means exclusive. And uh, even con con free, uh, con confrontational, just like uh, uh, Vice Admiral uh, uh, Pladish just mentioned, and IPS mainly for maritime countries, not for all countries in the region. And I think this uh, difference is very important. So relevant to this, some, some, some terms, some conception for BRI is not uh, feasible, I think. For example, it is a book. And uh, some, some people mentioned one issue, say BRI corridor. Actually, corridor is not a good term today for BRI. In the beginning, a lot of people, including myself, some, uh, sometimes mentioned the BRI as a kind of corridor. But today is different because BRI is not no membership actually. There's no scope and no, no, no board. It's not a corridor, it's just that kind of cooperation conception. It's my uh, first point uh, for comparison between BRI and the IPS. My second point about BRI's so-called achievement. Frankly, lots of so-called achievements of BRI I personally, I think, have been artificially exaggerated at, at home, at China and worldwide for different reasons, for different reasons. In China, you know, some people uh, from political reasons, they, they like to overstate BRI's achievements. And outside of China, uh, some other countries, a uh, lot of people uh, try to overstate the so-called China threats. They also like to overstate, uh, uh, exaggerate, uh, BRI's achievements. So actually not so big. We can some early earnings, but not uh, so big. And uh, BRI have some, some unimaginable achievements, I think. BRI is about lots of different issues, including IPS. Including IPS. I think without the BRI, maybe US and other country, countries would not uh, invite, sorry, invent IP as uh, for Japan. Japan have a free and open uh, in the Pacific version. I think it's also inspired by uh, BRI uh, for, for Korea, for China, Taiwan. They also have similar uh, uh, conception, so-called going south policy. So BRI has made many countries and regions pay more, pay more attention to regional issue, specifically for regional uh, infrastructure and network building issue. I think it's a good, good, good issue. The third point, actually China today has a much bigger conception than BRI, so-called shared future for, for, for mankind uh, destiny. So BRI is also in the process of deepening itself. It will also undergo a process from the boards uh, to growth, uh, and uh, to the end. So we should take BRI in a much bigger historical uh, perspective. The first point I want to say, BRI is initiated by China, but not belong to China. Of course, even in China, some people say BRI belong to China, it's not true. It is impossible, but it's also not feasible for any single country, including China, even US, can meet so huge demand for infrastructure building in developing countries. Not any single country can do it. China can't, US can't, India can't. 
So it's, it's something we must uh, cooperate, cooperate. And uh, I think uh, China just make a good start. We welcome every similar initiative or strategy to follow. With China or without China is also okay. So rude, anyway, the rude is rude always. And it doesn't matter who makes it, who, who builds it. And the money rude is a kind of a public good. Every country, every company, every people can use it. The final points I, I want to say, and uh, when I participate in uh, different international conference, China's political issue is usually become a hot topic. So I don't think it's a good point or good perspective for us to discuss lots of issues. Uh, of course, I frankly, China's political system is undergoing some change. But uh, I, for this issue, I want to make two points. The firstly, China's current political system has not changed fundamentally comparing to 10 years ago. China is still CPP uh, dominated. China is still uh, have a, a, a political system. We call it it's socialist with the Chinese uh, feature. We still engage with other countries. We still uh, uh, have a, a, a reform policy for economic system. We are continuing to do it. Just have a little bit of change, not fundamental change. This is the first point I want to say. The second point, even for China's political change, but this change is not the main reason for this world's change. It's not the main reason. And this world are facing lots of issues, uh, from economic uh, issue uh, to pandemic issue uh, to climate change issue. All of this is irrelevant with China's political change. Even for China-US relationship, for China-India relationship change, I do not think China's political change is the reason for this. Why we focus so much about this? Of course, I welcome every friend, professor, every boss talking about this. It's a care about China, but it's not our focus. It's not a real issue. So I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Sang Ziyadu, for your remarks. May I now invite uh, Dr. Amit Gupta. Dr. Amit Gupta is an associate professor at USAF, Air War College, Alabama, United States of America. His writing has focused on arms production and weapons proliferations, South Asia and Australian security policies, diaspora politics, popular culture and politics, and more recently on the US-China rivalry and the impact of demography on US foreign policy. His articles have appeared in Orbis, Asian Survey, Security Dialogue, The Roundtable, and The Mediterranean uh, Quarterly. He's also the author or editor of seven books, uh, the most recent, which are Air Power, The Next Generation, edited by uh, Dr. Gupta and published by Hauget Publishing in 2019, and Maritime Heritage and Challenges in the Indian Ocean and the Western Pacific. Uh, with Howard M. Hansel and Amit Gupta did jointly published by Rotlis in 2018. Uh, Dr. Gupta, over to you, and you also have 15 minutes. Okay, thank you, Pramod. Um, firstly, congratulations on the book and all good ideas start in coffee shops. I have two books which started in a coffee shop, so I completely understand where that came from. Look, I work for the United States Air Force, uh, as of June, I am retiring from the United States Air Force. So what I want to do today is take a position which is more academic than policy oriented. And let me put it again, since we're all going with five points, Panchashila, I'll also do that today. Let me start with number one. There is the reality of BRI. There is the hype of BRI. The hype of BRI is it would be a trillion dollars. It's more likely going to be somewhere between 250 to 350 billion dollars. But if you look at that, that's a huge amount of money to spread around the world and transform economies, infrastructure, so on. And as the speakers have said before, this is not something which you can ignore. And governments are welcoming it. 
governments have problems with it. Second thing you have to remember is the BRI doesn't happen in isolation. China now is heavily economically integrated with the rest of the world. I wrote an article on this, I'll just give you the data. China's largest trading partner is ASEAN, with whom it had $724 billion of trade. Then comes the EU with $645 billion. Then comes the United States with $568 billion. Then comes Japan with $330 billion. This is the sort of economic interconnectedness that you can't walk away from. And I'll explain that in a second. And it constrains the behavior of all the parties in this process. What I see is the world has three alternatives on looking at the BRI, looking at economic integration, looking at the future. One is you can compete with the BRI. The second is you can cooperate with the BRI. The third is you can go for conflict with China. And conflict is a spectrum, which I'll get to in a second. If you look at this in terms of competition, I once pointed this out to a group of NATO generals, along with Australians and New Zealanders. I said, if the Chinese are talking about spending a trillion, why can't you at least put together 250 billion to offer as an alternative or as a supplement to the rest of the world? And the answer was, it couldn't be done. It couldn't be done because the West is aging. The West has to put money into its own infrastructure, its own people. So right now, as things stand, China has an advantage there. Which then brings me to the second one, which is cooperation. And let us keep this in mind. The Chinese are building infrastructure. The Chinese are putting down the hardware, fiber optics in, us, uh, in Africa, so on. It is Western nations. It's the Western alliance, which includes Japan, which can give value to this infrastructure. It is the Western alliance which can bring all these countries into the digitized global economy, which will come through this kind of infrastructure. And keep this in mind, whatever policymakers may say in London, Washington, Tokyo, and Canberra, because they like to talk a lot in Canberra. Um, bottom line is businesses are looking very seriously at integrating into the BRI, whether we like it or not. And I, I would say one more thing on this very quickly, that the future was very clear to us after the pandemic came, where everybody started saying, well, we're going to cut supply chains from China. Instead, what has happened is they've increased buying things from China because they realize it's not that easy to break a supply chain. So do keep this in mind. That is on the competing part and the cooperating part. I think cooperation can make sense at a commercial level, but the points that Professor Taniguchi made, Admiral Chauhan made, are also very important, that while we cooperate, we have outstanding concerns. How are you going to address them? And that is where we come to the issue of conflict. And, and let me say this. Yes, there is a quad, very impressive. Um, here's what I thought was the most interesting thing that came out of the virtual quad meeting. That was the vaccine initiative, because that was the quad showing real leadership and saying, let us vaccinate the rest of the world. And until everybody in this 8 million pe billion people planet gets vaccinated, we're all going to be sitting in our homes and having this kind of conversation instead of me being in Kathmandu. Okay. I believe that the biggest challenge for the world is there is a large section of the world which is still underdeveloped. There is a large section of the world which doesn't meet the health and education standards which we should all aspire to. What can we do to build that? And I think that is where the West can make its largest contribution. I will bring up the issue of conflict. And let me say this, two parts to it. Number one, 
if you are talking about quad and little quads now, I'm gathering that UAE is considered to be a potential quad member. Should ask the Yemenis what they think about that. The fact of the matter is there are two countries apart from the United States, which are willing to engage in a military challenge to China. One is Japan, the other is India. Nobody else has the capacity, nobody else has the will. Let's be very clear about this. The Australians always say, we will go up to the southern tip of Indonesia, Malaysia. They're not talking of East China Sea and South China Sea. Please keep that one in mind, okay? And the Europeans are never going to show up in uh, East China Sea and South China Sea. So you've got to be careful about this one. I'll add one more thing. And that is this whole idea of AUKUS, which the minute it happened, I was aghast. I was like, security for Asia. And Admiral Chauhan's talked about this. Professor Taniguchi's talked about this. Professor Zhang has talked about this. Has to be an Asian conception. It can't be three white countries deciding what should be Asian security. And if you seriously wanted to do an AUKUS, the Indians should have been offered nuclear submarines. And I'd be interested in hearing what uh, Admiral Chauhan has to say about that. Let me end by saying this. As I see it, BRI is a reality. There are a lot of countries which are interested in it. Argentina recently said we're interested in it. It's not going away. You have to think of a way to offer something attractive to the rest of the world, which makes them say, we have a Chinese alternative, we have a Western alternative, we have a Japanese alternative, and we will take from all three. And I think that is the future. I'm not a believer in conflict and so on, because I think the biggest problem for the Western Alliance today is how to look after the people within the West. It's the same thing for Japan. Japan is an aging population. You have to look after your elderly. It's an Asian society. You know? we, we, we should keep this in mind. So I'm sorry if I've given a very peaceful approach to all this, but uh, I, I think the issues are developmental. I think the issues are ones where we should be talking increasingly in terms of globalization and cooperation. And this doesn't mean that diplomatic issues between nations cannot be resolved. This does not mean that diplomatic issues should be sidestepped. Every country has major security challenges and the Chinese do have to address those. That goes without saying. But in the meantime, this economic juggernaut cannot be rolled back. And I'll end with that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Amit Gupta for your remarks. I'd like to request our participants to drop their questions in chat or WhatsApp on the number that is displayed on the screen, or you may share it via Facebook or Twitter. We'll be taking just two to three questions as we'll have a very few minutes left at the end of the discussion. Uh, let me now invite uh, the editor uh, and contributors. Let me first I start with uh, Dr. Deepak Prakashvat. Dr. Deepak Prakashvat is an elected member of House of Representative at Federal Parliament of Nepal. Is a member of International Affairs Committee of the Federal Parliament of Nepal. Dr. Bhatt holds PhD from the School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Previously, he has served as a member of high level task force on reorienting Nepalese foreign policy, headed by Ministry of Foreign Affairs and member of Technical Committee and Secretariat, formed for supervision, integration, and rehabilitation of Maoist army combatants. He's a visiting faculty at Tribune University. Nepali Army Higher Command and Management Course, Army Command and Staff College, Institute of Crisis Management Studies, and Armed Police Force Command and Staff College of Nepal. He has also participated at the DKI, Asia Pacific Center for Strategic Studies Hawaii, a study of United States Institutes on Foreign Policy, His Majesty, His Majesty Government uh, Security and Justice Service at University of Birmingham, an advanced level course on disarmament, demobilization and reintegration course of technical in transition at Transition International, the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Bhatt, over to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pramod. Thank you for uh, providing me 
to speak uh, on the book uh, as we are talking about rebalancing Asia. And I'm thankful to panel, Dr. Tanagoji, Admiral Chauhan, Professor Zhang Jiadong, and Professor Amit Gupta for your intrinsic contributions that you have been looking how world is heading in 21st century, what are the core issues and the problems uh, are in surface or under surface. And uh, from my side, what I have seen when Pramod and I talked about the idea of book, two parallel world strategies were in conception. I mean, though we can uh, recall uh, Dr. Taniguchi, as you mentioned, like, yes, the confluence of the two seas uh, was a, uh, a speech given by former Prime Minister Abe in Indian Parliament, where he was talking about free and open Indo Pacific, and at the same time, uh, two continents and the two oceans or the seas come together for free and open Indo Pacific. And it was 2007 and 2013, One Belt, One Road, or the, today's BRI or BNR concept was uh, introduced by President Xi Jinping. So what we were talking, was Asia was balanced earlier or unbalanced or disbalanced, something like that. And then and now where we are talking about rebalancing this Asia or the Asia Pacific. So linking it with Belt and Road Initiative, to an IPS, to parallel mega strategies or the grand strategies to dominate or make, you know, uh, something where working with partners is, is only with the soft powers or with hard powers. So that was a big question. And if you look at the GDPs of India and China for first 15 or 1700 years of zero to 18th century, they were very dominant. They occupied 70% of the world GDP and gradually they were in condition where we have seen in the last 250 years of about three years where the uh, emergence of the uh, capitalism in the Western society or Western uh, economies and then colonialism on this. So without going into uh, detail on that part, what I see that as I said, working with partners is always there that we have seen in the world, um, uh, and yes, world wars, both the great world wars, and then during the Cold War. So is this a second version of the Cold War? Is it, uh, are we going to face that one where hard and soft issues are amalgamated or mixed very uh, finely and all maritime mode actions are going to, uh, you know, like taken into the maritime or the seed woods while we see the Okush or nuclear submarine issue is the recent, not only the Quad, because I mean, it's a very interesting uh, moment here that Quad foreign ministers are meeting at the Melbourne now. They're talking about, I mean, Quad or the Quad dialogue, security dialogue. And, and China is along moving with more than 100 countries and talking about the economic cooperation, of course, uh, uh, it can extend uh, and you not only limiting with the uh, geopolitical or uh, I mean, leaving the geoeconomic or the geospatial or the geo uh, strategic issues aside. So influence in overall over a, I mean, Asia and the Pacific is there. So the Indo-Pacific is, is, is waiting for that. And uh, for me, all these things on all these, I mean, both these uh, mega strategies are influencing uh, and uh, the milestone of foreign policy of these, these countries, especially the US uh, Quad countries on one hand and the China on the other hand, and, and what kind of implementation they are looking for. If you look at, uh, I will uh, say uh, one example, like uh, in Nepali context, yes, uh, it's not loaded one, but the MCC debate is 
heavily ongoing, and that debate we have seen in the Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and, and many other countries also. So, uh, how it will go, how where it will converge uh, from quad to AUKUS, and what kind of mechanisms, quadrilateral or the trilateral, or these kind of uh, things will emerge. And as uh, Professor, uh, as uh, Admiral Chohan mentioned, like you know the uh, the these. Uh, uh, maritime or or oceans are uh, dominant for future conflicts i mean not pointing on that but possibilities and uh, countries like nepal and it's not the only the countries like nepal but it is like uh, developing countries those gdps are weak developing i mean just trying to upgrade it to the modern uh, or like you know the uh, from least developed to the developed uh, or developing countries is a big challenge. So what will and what are uh, the policies or, you know, coping with this, these kind of foreign policies or the uh, rivalries or, or, or things will. And in this book, as you mentioned, Dr. Pramod at the beginning, uh, a great contribution has been made by scholars from around the world. So uh, we'll be looking for engaging with you or scholars and contributors in the future and the verse also so with this i will stop here thank you thank you all uh, thank you dr dip Prasad. may i now invite the contributors uh, i'd like to request all our contributors to introduce themselves and make the remarks in less than five minutes maximum five minutes so that we can have some time for maybe a one round of wrap up or maybe uh, one or two questions we can pick up so may I now invite Dr. Bhavna Singh. Bhavna, are you there? Bhavna Singh, could you please unmute yourself? Uh, let's move to the next speaker. I think there's some issues with her microphone. Uh, Bezad Abdul Harpur. Uh, he has yes. contributed a paper on Belt and Road Initiative versus Indo-Pacific strategy, increasing U.S.-China strategic distrust. So over to you, Bezal. Thank you, Professor Jaiswal. Uh, this is Bezal Abdullah from Iran. Uh, I got my MA in North American Studies from Faculty of World Studies, University of Tehran. And currently, I'm a postgraduate student at Renmin University of China. Well, uh, first of all, let me uh, express my thanks to the Research Association of Nepal Institute for International Cooperation and Engagement and the editors of the book that provide us this opportunity to share our knowledge with other uh, scholars. Actually, uh, as one of the uh, contributors uh, of uh, this great uh, book, I want to uh, provide you with some short information with the gist of my uh, chapter in a few uh, minutes. Well, the Indo-Pacific region, as we know, has become the main wrestling arena for US and China. With the inception of uh, US Indo-Pacific strategy and China's uh, BRI, the, uh, the strategic rivalry between US and China has come uh, to the fore. And in my chapter, I offered uh, both Chinese and US perspectives of BRI and US uh, in the Pacific strategy to explain how this strategic distrust in China US uh, relations could be affected by these uh, initiatives. While uh, Americans are uh, suspicious about uh, BRI, since they have a lot of uh, questions about the underlying motivations behind these initiatives, the Chinese side is concerned of US in the Pacific strategy and consider this as a response to China's rise in general and as an alternative to BRI in the region. I also discussed about the potential challenges that could threaten the implementation of BRI and in the Pacific strategy in, in the region of Indo-Pacific. In conclusion part, I discussed that as long as there are anti-American and anti-Chinese sentiment behind BRI and Indo-Pacific strategy, we would witness the increasing 
mutual distrust between US and China, discussing BRI and Indo-Pacific strategy, this study offer an opportunity to identify the divergent and convergent areas in which uh, in the uh, Sino-US uh, trajectory. Uh, I believe that uh, the uh, perceiving BRI and Indo-Pacific strategy as the tools of marginalizing US and China's long-term uh, strategies and goals in the Indo-Pacific region would not only uh, prevent both sides uh, to realize these goals, but also uh, denigrate the images of both great powers as uh, the uh, countries, as the great powers that carry special responsibility in order to deal with the global issues. Uh, so both US and China need to formulate better response to BRI and in the Pacific strategy in order to identify uh, the convergent and divergent areas in their relations in order to manage the competitive aspects of uh, their uh, relations. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to share my knowledge with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Behzad. Uh, Dr. Bhavna, would, would you like to start now? Is your microphone working? Okay, uh, let's move to Asantha Sene Virathana. Uh, he is from Sri Lanka and he contributed on uh, Belt and Road Initiative and indo pacific Studies Challenges and Opportunities for Sri Lanka. Asantha, over to you. Let me uh, make you co-host so that you can unmute. Yes, now please unmute yourself. Uh, yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Jiswal. Uh, I, I am Asanta Seniratna from uh, Department of Strategic Studies, uh, Kotalawa Defense University in Sri Lanka. Uh, I'm happy to speak um, about my chapter. I, uh, I wrote a chapter titled, um, Hindu Pacific Strategy and Belt and Road Initiative, uh, Opportunities and Challenges for Sri Lanka. Um, you know, in the chapter, I highlighted that um, due to Sri Lanka's strategic location uh, within the Indian Ocean, uh, it have attracted both, uh, you know, the interest of the Indo Pacific strategy uh, as well as the BRI. Uh, in the beginning of the chapter, I have highlighted that um, Sri Lanka has become an important partner to BRI uh, even before it was announced in 2013. Uh, it was uh, President uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa who's, um, who was in power from 2005 to 2015 uh, that um, during that era, uh, the, the relations between China and Sri Lanka uh, gradually came to a very um, high level. Uh, the, there was many Chinese investments, um, uh, uh, notably the port of Hambantota. They started building the port of Hambantota and also they invested heavily in port of Colombo. Now, um, by 2000, in, um, the government changed Sri Lanka. Um, and uh, that new government tried to uh, have a, um, you know, a sort of a balanced approach between the, um, you know, China uh, and also the other countries, other powers like the, you know, the United States uh, and India. Um, and with that also, uh, this Indo-Pacific strategy, um, under the Indo-Pacific strategy, there were many proposals to Sri Lanka. Uh, they proposed various development initiatives. The U.S. Um, actually came up with this, um, you know, Millennium uh, Challenge Cooperation project. I think uh, Nepal is undertaking uh, that uh, 480 million uh, development project. Uh, then Japan and India collaborated uh, and suggested many projects in Port of Colombo and Port of Trincomalee. Um, so these projects were under discussion. Um, uh, over time, uh, some have been uh, rejected by Sri Lankan government, especially this notably this um, uh, MCC agreement, uh, 
uh, was rejected due to um, uh, you know certain reasons um, um, and um, uh, india has invested in port of colombo a 500 million dollar investment has come from india to start you know build a new terminal in the port of colombo uh, where chinese are chinese presence is uh, very much visible in port of colombo and also uh, under BRI, we received the largest ever foreign direct investment called Port City Project. Uh, that is around, that will um, go till 2040. Uh, that will attract more than 20 billion US dollar investments uh, into the uh, Port of Colombo. Um, so um, in recent times, um, what we see is Sri Lanka is using the sort of the competition between the IPS and BRI to attract projects to Sri Lanka. Uh, in a way, um, that is a good thing, uh, but Sri Lanka, I, I have mentioned in my uh, chapter, Sri Lanka should do it in a way uh, that should not generate suspicion um, uh, uh, about Sri Lanka's, you know, relations with, uh, uh, you know, on, the, on, on India's, India should not suspect Sri Lanka about Sri Lanka's relations with China. At the same time, China should not um, you know, uh, have any, um, you know, suspicion about Sri Lanka's relations with IPS. I think in recent times, Sri Lanka have been um, successful in balancing uh, and getting the opportunities that is provided by uh, these two uh, initiatives and uh, uh, large scale development assistance have come uh, 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 from um, uh, both the, uh, you know, IPS and BRI. Uh, so, in my chapter, I, I, I have highlighted these things. Um, um, then, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Jiswal, for giving me this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Asanta. May I now invite Alessandro Alabana. Alessandro Alabana and Antonio Ferrori had contributed chapter on China and the BRI, challenges and opportunity for Southeast Asia. Alessandro, over to you. I think we lost connection with him. Uh, Binod, are you there or any of the contributors? If you're there, please drop a message if you can't unmute yourself. Else we'll go to a quick question and answer round. We have received five of the questions. Any other contributors? If you're there, please identify yourself. Drop a message in the chat. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, uh, since we have hardly 10 minutes uh, to wrap up, uh, I, I try to club the questions uh, together. Like there are lots of questions on US-China rivalry, like how US-China rivalry is going to impact Asia. And there are lots of questions and lots of concern on economic issues. There is a question that, as I believe that this rivalry will have huge e economic impact on the world and more on Asia is the world prepare for it in the post pandemic time. So there are lots of questions on US China rivalry, how it is going to impact the world, what will the economic impact apart from a strategic and political and are we prepared for that? Uh, this is the overall question that we have got and uh, I've tried to uh, not take all the questions because of time question, but uh, now let's go in the reverse order and request all the uh, speakers to make their remarks in two to three minutes. So let me start in reverse order. Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Amit Gupta, over to you. Thank you, Pramod. Look, uh, US-China rivalry, very simply, I've already said, it's there's competition, which is economic. There is a challenge where obviously the points that Professor Taniguchi has made, Admiral Chauhan has made, there are issues of sovereignty and so on, which the Chinese have to understand the concerns of other people in Asia. Otherwise, this doesn't go away, okay? Third one is obviously cooperation. You cannot co uh, solve global problems without large powers, great powers cooperating. Very simple example being the pandemic, okay? Which brought back globalization in a big way. But I'll say one last thing on the US-China rivalry. The US-Soviet rivalry was won by the US because it was able to convince the world 
that it had a better economic, social, political system. Not because it had more bombers or nuclear weapons. That stuff is stupid. The question now is, in the 21st century, what are you going to offer the rest of the world which makes your model of economic development, political development, social development look better? And for God's sake, stop talking about democratization. Because if you look at the confusion in the West on democratization, don't give lectures to the Turks, the Indians, uh, who else can I think of, the Hungarians, and so on. I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gupta. May I now invite uh, Professor Sang Yadam to make his remarks. Professor Jadom, could you please let me unmute yours? Yes, please unmute yourself now. You can do it on your side. Sir, over to you. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pramod. I just uh, uh, make some points just the following uh, I mean. So I, I agree with a lot of uh, points made, so points of view. So, Today, I see the Asia uh, is mainly uh, not an issue between China and the uh, United States. It's about uh, how about our future, how to how for us to develop our economy. And uh, actually, Chinese China model, and many people like to say, even in China, and uh, frankly, China model is much similar to Japan's, to South Korea's. You know, uh, when Japan and South Korea in industrialization phase. They also have very strong governments uh, with the market economy principle. So it's very successful. I think not just China. So Chinese still uh, in change, and the change will uh, decide our future. I think they would also have a lot of very, very big uh, influence on Asia's future and the world future. I, I hope our friends and uh, the national at, at home and uh, can give us more help and uh, constructive comments. I think it should be useful for us and for Asia, not just the criticize each other, not just the point at each other. It would be unuseful. Uh, as here, thank you, Pramod. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jadon. Uh, Admiral Pradeep Tohan, over to you. Uh, thank you, Pramod, uh, for the second opportunity. And uh, let me say thank you also to my uh, fellow panelists for some wonderful comments that have been made. Uh, I entirely agree with Amit that uh, great powers must cooperate. Uh, however, I really do not believe that this uh, business of Asia uh, is going to be settled one way or another by the binary rivalry of uh, China and the United States. I think this is not only simplistic, it is quite dangerous and it is definitely disdainful of the real of the realities that pervade because the, the region is not uh, a bunch of, um, as I said earlier, ciphers that are waiting for one or the other power to play black or to play white on some imaginary board, uh, game board. So uh, I think that um, this 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 belief that is being propagated that the impact will be enormous and whether the rivalry between China and the USA will be the determinant of Asian progress is, uh, to my mind, uh, simply incorrect. Uh, it, it, it needs some more scholarship than that. Finally, I wanted to say that the social uh, sociopolitical attractiveness uh, point that Amit made, once again, is something that I really agree with in terms of the context of the uh, erstwhile Cold War rivals, the uh, Soviet Union and the United States. Now, the question is whether the Chinese uh, approach vis-a-vis -vis the Belt and Road Initiative can actually assuage the uh, apprehensions of many of the countries that are that have been built by past behavior because one thing you must always remember and i think we'd be foolish to forget is that predictions of future behavior are based upon examples of past behavior and if you want to change the future acceptability of a system and you haven't got a happy past about it, then you must be able to invest the time in which you will correct those mistakes of the past and project yourself properly. Otherwise, this rivalry is going to be uh, a, it's going to be in the academic world alone and it's not going to be 
translated into the real world. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Admiral Pradeep Chauhan. Uh, Professor Tomohiko Taniguchi, over to you, sir. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to make a final comment uh, in closing this seminar. Uh, I cannot uh, start without saying uh, uh, how much appreciated I've been to you, um, Dr. Jaiswal. Now, uh, a couple things. Interconnectedness matters, of course. China is the most interconnected uh, economy probably humans ever seen. China is the number one trading partner for all of us, including the United States, India, China, Japan, and so on and so forth. However, when it comes to making rules, setting rules, uh, thinking about good governance, uh, that is the one that international cooperation matters more. Herein comes no room for China centricism. It is the internationalism that should play a role. And then the uh, network of um, like-minded countries involving Japan, India, United States, ASEAN nations and Australia and so forth uh, should play a great role in setting rules and norms for the future prosperity of mankind. That's my first point. Related to that, I must warn uh, some of my colleagues who wish to mix Japanese development with China's. Ever since Japan chose to modernize the country in 1860s, with the exception you observe, observe only in the, 19, in the late 1930s, Japan uh, embraced freedom of press, freedom, freedom of religion, and freedom of assemblies and so on. So there is a stark, stark difference between China and Japan for that matter. Third, economic considerations do matter, but there is a gray rhino in the region, that's China, looking at Taiwan. If, for instance, China chooses to exert military might over and upon Taiwan, there would be no room for us to talk anything about economy. So in order for China not to resort to any military adventurism, again, the coalition of like-minded democracies counts, namely Japan, China, Japan, India, Australia, and the United States, and others. This cannot and should not and should not happen and should not be allowed to happen. That's my final remark. Uh, thank you, Professor Tomohiko Taniguchi. We have got connected with uh, Alessandro Alaba, Alabana. Uh, Alexandro, over to you. Yes, thank you very much to the editors and to the colleagues who have contributed to this uh, volume. I will be very brief. Uh, me and Antonio Fiori, who is a colleague of mine, have written uh, an article on the influence and the implications of um, the Belt and Road Initiative in Southeast Asia. Uh, we contend uh, that at the end of the day, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative has potential to provide China with growing influence in the region, but we do not overlook the uh, factual uh, shortfalls and the critical aspects that the Belt and Road Initiative is likely to face and is uh, currently facing in Southeast Asia. Um, we contend that uh, geographical proximity and um, you know, strengthening political ties between China uh, and the countries of the region are making Southeast Asia a critical area for uh, the success of uh, the initiative. Um, basically, we think that in this context, the Belt and Road Initiative uh, has more or less the same uh, 
characteristics and the same uh, problems that it has uh, worldwide. So basically the, the picture is mixed, it's not rosy, it's not um, necessarily uh, conducive to um, a disaster uh, whatsoever, but uh, the picture is mixed. So uh, it very much depends on how the relationship between China and countries in the region will uh, unravel uh, in the next future. Uh, we also see um, an uneven landscape where we have countries with a very sound political ties and economic ties with China. We have countries, we see countries which have a more uh, nuanced, a more balanced and a more uh, and the cooler to some extent uh, interconnection with China. And we have countries, we see countries in the region, a group of countries in the region that uh, have some kind of confrontational approach to China and with which China has uh, some confrontational approach too. So we think that the, the next future will bring a lot uh, to, to, to see, to analyze, to examine. And for now, uh, we see more um, factors supporting uh, uh, the consolidation of China's influence in the region rather than uh, you know, uh, a developing, um, um, a, de a declining, a declining, uh, pathway for the belt for the belt for the belt and road initiative sorry uh in the region i stop here and uh, i thank you very much for the opportunity uh thank you so much alexandro professor tomohiko taniguchi admiral pradeep chohan professor chang Ziyadong, dr amit gupta thank you so much for your valuable time we really had interesting and insightful uh, discussion and we wish to have you again in future i'd also like to thank uh, dr deepak prakash Vata and all the contributors of the book um, and also the wonderful audience for their participation. We hope to engage with you all in future in such, uh, in this kind of academic engagement. We request everyone to read the book, write book reviews and provide feedback to us. Thank you so much. Have a nice day.